Thank you for choosing to come to this talk. Uh, I know there's a lot of other options. My name's Jimmy. Uh, this is a, an inaugural talk for me, so um, I think it should be fun. This is built on a lot of uh, the past eight months of work, basically, uh, that we've been kind of wrapping our heads around how to better the supply chain um, and some unique and novel ways to do that. So we're going to be uh, releasing some things today for you all to play with uh, and a, a variety of other uh, hopefully interesting methodologies to kind of wrangle uh, software supply chain security. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO, hello, welcome, of a company called Rad Security. We have a booth here. Check us out. Uh, I'm all over LinkedIn and the internet, so if you need to ask me questions, please do. Okay, so um, everyone has to have the XKCD comic, uh, you know, uh, someone randomly propping up the entire internet with a package, an image, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, the interesting thing, and the, the DBIR, uh, the, the Verizon data breach uh, report that comes out every year, is starting to highlight supply chain security. Um, my background is not historically in supply chain security for software. This has been a, a somewhat recent journey of mine that I've uh, been in a rabbit hole with recently because you can't read anything these days without talking about software supply chain security. So huge jump in awareness. Uh, we're, we're dealing with things even this week with the, uh, the supply chain attack polyfill and, and a variety of things we'll talk about. Um, and I wanted to share during this short time, what kind of how we're thinking about um, looking at the behavior or runtime characteristics of open source images and applications, which uh, hopefully is interesting. So just to kind of lay, get a lay of the land of supply chain um, and what we mean by the ecosystem in, in software supply chain, who here uses SBOMs? Do we use them? Do you use, or we just, create them, are they actually used for anything? Maybe, maybe not. Um, an SBOM is like your nutrition label on the back of your, you know, your food that you're buying at the grocery store, right? Software bill materials, all the components, libraries, versions, licenses, et cetera. Um, software composition analysis, SCA tools, another uh, kind of uh, you know, suite of, of tooling that's been around for a long time to identify vulnerabilities. Um, CVEs. We've all dealt with CVEs. Uh, there's a million and one vendors out there trying to solve the CVE issue of just too many. Um, you, you, know, you could talk to the folks at ChainGuard. Um, they have some interesting solutions there. Artifact signing, so cryptographic verification. Um, all of these things really kind of feed into uh, salsa or supply chain levels for software artifacts. Uh, this is more of like a grading or posture of how you're doing with um, your software supply chain. So this is primarily um, what we have today as far as tooling when it comes to the software supply chain or the security of that software. But there's still some gaps. Um, and these are just kind of blowing up every day. We're starting to see more and more uh, issues here. So even as far as like this week with Polyfill, if you're following along with some of the drama there. Uh, that's a really interesting one. But as you know, I started looking into this and, and trying to piece together a story around software supply chain security, really there's, there's big gaps to fill. Um, I don't think anybody's uh, got an end-to-end -end solution, nor am I proposing an end-to-end -end solution. But I think that we have focused really on this you know, kind of shift left aspect, right? Looking at libraries. Um, versions of libraries, uh, artifact signing, these things happen you know, earlier in the SDLC. And that doesn't, to me at least, really tell the whole picture. Um, pretty narrow scope. I think software supply chain attacks aren't uh, re reducing because we have SBOMs, I guess, uh, or because we're signing artifacts. So I'm going to propose some things today and, and share some work we've been doing to kind of complete the loop. Um, and you know, we talked about pre-deployment, right? S-bombs, SCA, CVE scanning. These things happen before your application's actually running, for the most part. Now, what if we can shift the supply chain discussion right, right, at runtime? Um, this was literally six months ago. I was just 
at a whiteboard with you know some coworkers drawing boxes, and I felt like this um, is this even possible, right? To to kind of increase your supply chain security posture at runtime, maybe. Um, so we had a hypothesis to set out to kind of prove, and today is the first time we're actually you know I'll be sharing some of uh, what we found. So <clears throat> we all are probably sick of hearing about solar winds. Um, myself included, but we're gonna use it as our case study because it actually has some interesting elements that I think runtime um, detection can, can help with. So solar winds was interesting because like we use this word sophisticated, right, or, or APT or advanced, but it actually was fairly sophisticated. The in, you know, implanting into the Orion software update uh, CICD process and, and um, you know, sending those updates to government targets, et cetera, um, it wasn't really easy to detect, right? And traditional methods, like an S-bomb isn't gonna help you in a scenario like this. Um, cosine or artifact signing isn't necessarily going to help if your CI-CD platform is completely owned sideways. So um, could we apply some sort of runtime attestation to this flow? Maybe. So. Um, the you know kind of how this this works at a high level uh, solar winds but this could really be any quasi sophisticated supply chain attack you have your supplier and then you have your consumer and some steps in between right so typically what we see is um, a push towards signing artifacts uh, signing images uh, etc um, SAST or DAST or, or, or you know SCA tools running as part of CI. Uh, and then ultimately, like an XDR style runtime solution later, that's not really context aware of that that whole supply chain. So, you know, if you really break it down, the the, the you know what we talked about first with all of the S bomb artifacts signing, et cetera, doesn't really tell the picture of somebody actively compromising your CI CD as the software supplier, right? This build step is really important. You can sign a malicious artifact. Uh, you can own the, the, the signing process and um, bypass any of these steps pretty easily. So what if we could actually verify the, you know, the expected behavior of an application? Again, solar winds maybe, um, that, you know, but you know, we're gonna start with images and containers uh, first. And so that's what we set out to do. Uh, we we've went and kind of back to the drawing board and using eBPF for what it's really good at, collecting kind of kernel level telemetry, uh, process tree information, uh, files that are touched, network connections, metadata about the running workload. Um, could we collect that in a reproducible way that generates an artifact? Kind of looks like an S bomb. Uh, kind of feels like an S bomb, but it actually describes runtime behavior. So if we can monitor that behavior, ship that artifact right alongside the application, suppliers have a known good runtime state before the application's running, could we theoretically stop a supply chain attack um, like the ones we're seeing today? So that was the hypothesis. Um, and this is really meant to complement what's out there, right? Not, it's not gonna replace an S-bomb, it's not gonna replace signing artifacts. Uh, it is really just an enhancement layer and still a proposal. Um, we're, we're, we're putting a lot of work in this space and at the end you'll see the call to action for help um, because we've open sourced some of these things. But this is, this, is the, this is the theory, right? And it's actually working pretty well. So you know, if you look at the attack sequence of you know, solar winds or name your supply chain attack, if a supplier can verify runtime behavior before they ship the software, I know that my application calls you know, this you know, network endpoint, this, this, this host name has this sort of pattern or fingerprint for a process tree, touches these files, all collected by eBPF, we can verify that um, if we sign it you know, at runtime. So this was kind of the, the beginning steps of, of formulating this fingerprint structure. Um, so we put together some standards. This is not a quote unquote standard yet. We're actually working to um, solidify some of that and, and we're looking for help there. But these, these key points really we should have the ability to hash these fingerprints. We don't want somebody tampering, tampering with them. 
we need to understand what is normal and what is anomalous, right? If you're running your application or your container, it has these characteristics, drift occurs, welcome, and it, you know, is that good, bad, and different? Um, and then we had to get out some examples, right? And uh, that was kind of, that's the phase we're in now. We're, we're stress testing this hypothesis with a working end-to-end -end platform. So uh, we then built the structure for the fingerprint, right? So this is a, um, a YAML or JSON style artifact. It's version controlled. You can treat it just like, again, you would treat an SBOM. And you can see here, this is um, a fingerprint for a cert manager, right? Cert Manager being an application that you would run as a container inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Everyone runs Cert Manager these days. Um, and we want to understand the behavior at runtime of Cert Manager so we know the process tree, the, the arguments for the programs that start, uh, the network connections that are created. So the nice thing here is this is checked in as code just like everything else that you'd be dealing with from a day-to-day -day basis, right? It's not an SBOM. I really hesitate to call it an R bomb. It's something in between, right? I, we don't need more bombs uh, at this particular moment. So this is the general structure. Uh, and there are some advantage to, advantages to this. Um, by using these behavioral fingerprints, we now have a real-time detection mechanism. The whole goal here, again, is to stop supply chain attacks that you know, maybe spawn a week later or 10 days later, like the solar winds attack did. Um, and just keep the integrity high. Uh, so we also want to uh, make these tamper-proof. This is something that's on the roadmap. Uh, we have not implemented this quite yet, and I'll, I'll show you why and how. Um, and then we want to have comprehensive coverage. So uh, the first pass at this is with container images. It is not uh, thick client applications. Like We're not doing this with like Slack or something you would run on your, your, your endpoint or your actual machine. So we're focused on, on containers out of the gate. And I'll show you what that looks like. So we, as, as RAD Security, have already been using this now for about four months in product, which has been really, really cool. Um, the whole premise here, again, automatically create known good behavioral baselines. When drift occurs, we're going to classify it and um, look at that entire drift sequence. And then we're actually bringing in uh, a little help from an LLM uh, or a series of LLMs here to give you this this like rundown in, in readable language of what's happening. So this is a Jupyter notebook um, public image pulled from Docker Hub, exercised in an EKS cluster. Uh, in blue is the uh, the baseline that we've built, and then in red is actually me inside execing around using Python to spin up a reverse shell, et cetera, et cetera. And this is actually working really, really well. So we're using this with customers. And then in the process, we're also republishing this back to our RAD catalog. So um, I'm going to show you what that looks like uh, right now. So the, the RAD catalog, uh, we, we pushed our first version of this, I don't know, uh, four, yeah, probably four months ago or so. Um, and I think. Some people were putting their hand up to participate. Other people were scratching their heads. And some people didn't know what the pretty graphics were. So since then, we have continued to kind of refine this fingerprint algorithm because there is a lot going on to create these. You know, We have a stream of eBPF events. We have to reconstruct to make them re reproducible. Um, so now we have kind of uh, V2 of the, uh, the RAD catalog, which uh, literally just most of the UI changes got pushed out this morning, um, which is you know startup life. But we'll show you what that looks like and how how we're kind of thinking about the future of this. So this is kind of the I guess demo part of the the talk. Any questions so far? Anything? Maybe. Okay. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in, in today we have eBPF that is sending the constant stream of events that are happening. And the detection piece is the drift algorithm. There's like a drift algorithm. So um, 
not all drift is bad, so we have to verify that the drift that we see doesn't match certain patterns of that fingerprint. And if we see something that, a classic example would be like kubectl exec, and you're just smashing the keyboard inside of a container, like that's going to create a drift sequence that we then flag, and then we analyze to see if it's dangerous. So um, eBPF's only responsible for collecting that telemetry, and then it's all kind of in the SAS that's doing the drift detection. But I'll talk about what we're, we're kind of on our roadmap for open source verification, because that's a, a separate step too. Um, so this is the um, this is the rad the the, the new rad catalog. So um, what we've done here is essentially we go to Docker Hub or Quay and um, or any kind of open sort of image registry. And if you go here now, we're in a I guess housekeeping state where we're transferring a bunch of images from V1 to V2. So you'll see uh, more and more here, but. We pull these images down, and then we have scripts that run inside of our own clusters that, that spin up these containers. And we use eBPF, again, to, to capture that uh, telemetry, and then we build this behavioral baseline. So this is uh, uh, Ingress Nginx from Quay. We've baselined it, but we've also baselined all, like, not every version, but um, many of the versions, and we can do like a comparison. So this will make sense in, in a second, but the reason we want to do that is to show changes in CVE count, changes in behavior over the course of time. Uh, we're working on a GitHub action or a CI plugin that can actually catch this stuff earlier. So it's really, we're trying to give you the full spectrum of this image in CI so you can make an informed decision. Like, you know, imagine if Ingress Nginx um, when you bump the version, introduce three new outbound network connections, right? That would be something that you would want to be aware of because maybe that's intentional, maybe it's not. Um, so we're trying to, it's a tall order, but we're trying to, to hit the, the top 500 images on Docker Hub, exercise them, publish the results, and then build this CI ecosystem that can help you catch runtime issues earlier or, supply, or actual supply chain attacks. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. So some of the new V2 stuff that we released that I'm excited about, um, you could see down below we do a whole like diff analysis. So if you're looking at you know version 1.8.4 uh, version versus I think probably this is probably latest, um, you're going to see how many new packages have been introduced. You're going to see how many new vulnerabilities have been introduced. If we have a baseline, you'll see the diff, right? You know, the process looks different from the version before, the process tree or the network access. So um, there's a lot of metadata here. We also publish the SBOM. Um, and in this case, we have a fingerprint here. So uh, this is what, you know, again, reiterate, we pulled in Ingress Nginx, ran it, um, and, and exercised most of its configuration at runtime, and then we're publishing the results. So this is what this particular container looks like in a runtime representation, right? We have, you know, the whole, you know, the, the whole process and file and program. If there were any network connections, like in this case, MongoDB, right? Download some stuff from downloads.mongodb.com. It also, you know, talks to compass.mongodb.com. Um, and this is the last iteration of the, the catalog. Like I said, we're moving everything over right now. So, that and then we have our packages, right? So we have all the packages that this particular version of Ingress Nginx uses with associated uh, vulnerabilities. Um, all the vulns, uh, you know, and then detailed comparison is, uh, is uh, let me see, right here, is actually gonna be able to tell you what increased or decreased, so with the, uh, the different changes. So this is an evolving thing, um, we, we don't, have all the, everything solved from from uh, from from all angles, but what we're starting to see is these patterns emerge in open source images. Databases behave a certain way, like proxies behave a certain way. So we're trying to make sense of that and make our baselining and fingerprinting a little more intelligent. So um, that's that's the 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 catalog. Uh, if you want to get involved, you can 
find me or you can just request a demo or find many buttons that can help with that. Um, the next steps for us really and, and how, how this is going to evolve, um, my dream would be to work with maintainers. Like if you maintain Ingress Nginx and similar to how you would ship, uh, you know, how you would sign your, uh, your builds with, with something like Cosign, we would love to be able to work with maintainers to get these baselines refined and actually ship that artifact along with the, um, the image release, even as part of the OCI image metadata. Like you pull it from Docker Hub, it's just embedded in there. Um, so kind of that supplier relationship, that's something we're working on right now. Uh, we have seen really early success with using LLMs to look at drift in a more broad spectrum and detect essentially supply chain attacks, right? If something's embedded in that uh, particular image, then we can act on that. So that's uh, something we're enhancing right now. Uh, also, any sort of like threat intelligence, IP reputation. So if you remember in that, that fingerprint, we're actually seeing IP addresses, domain names, um, we're tracking how those images interact with other systems. Um, we're working on baking in kind of like IP reputation uh, uh, checks. Even as far as um, there's a recent cryptocurrency miner campaign going on attacking Kubernetes. It's like the Dero cryptocurrency miner V2. Like, and we actually analyzed some of the images before they yanked them off of Docker Hub. Um, they're very suspicious IP addresses. Like they're, they're, they're a bunch of naked IP addresses. The other one, the other IP or uh, domains were like windowsupdatesforyou.com. And uh, we can um, use kind of threat intel and IP reputation, bake that into the fingerprint, and we can find these sort of things because they're distributed on Docker Hub earlier. Uh, the CI plugin is the definitely the most requested bit of functionality here. If you can find a runtime deviation in CI and never have it touch your Kubernetes cluster, like that's a win. Um, why wait until the, you know, the end? So we're working on some clever ways to use eBPF as part of the build process to do that. Um, and then we need uh, a lot more images. Uh, we have about 50 that we're porting over from the old um, catalog. And now we're just turning on, kind of opening the floodgates. We have a lot of automation that we've built to pull images from Docker Hub, Quay, et cetera. We have been collecting open source images and telemetry from uh, you know, all the, the standard Kubernetes stuff like Cert Manager. But we just need more and more and more. And then we can make a better analysis of like what's going on and patterns will emerge. Um, and then timelines are. Timelines are really interesting. If you look at Ingress Nginx and you want to map behavior over time, like it's a really um, eye-opening kind of thing to see like these major changes in, in images that you pull down every day. They're introducing some, some pretty gnarly things. Like they're, they're talking to new IP addresses. They're using uh, different methods you know, for spawning new processes. They're sideloading stuff later. So for us, we want to be able to map one image over time, all its releases, and all of the behaviors associated with it. Um, and then the version to version diff analysis, we ship that uh, pretty much today. So you'll see, you'll see more and more of that. Uh, and then ultimately, we are going to release a verification mechanism. So you as the, the consumer of these you know, fingerprints, if you want to verify the Ingress Nginx, you know, beyond the, the you know, does the S-bomb exist, beyond does co is it signed, um, but we want to verify that Ingress Nginx isn't misbehaving at runtime, uh, we're going to be you know, releasing some tooling to run inside of your environment that can do that verification check. So eBPF based, um, and that's like, that completes the, the picture, at least in my mind. So um, expect more and more, I think we are, close to time, or at least Q&A. So um, hopefully uh, that's interesting. I know it's like not a standard supply chain talk because this stuff is a little bit new and emerging, but we are seeing some really, really 
uh, compelling early uh, wins with this, this methodology. And I'd be happy to take questions or um, have a discussion. So thank you. I know it's almost lunch. Everyone's half asleep. Um, but I'm happy to uh, wrap up the conference. And thanks for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like two sides to CI. One would be, well, there's a there's like a bootstrapping problem. Like we either have seen the image or not. So, I think if we can work with suppliers or at least the big, you know, top fifty images because they're everywhere, we can do better than that. Because two minutes isn't going to tell you. It it's going to track some things, but it's not going to track the thing that you know the the shell that spawned a week later. Um, CI will be at least in, it's actually easier for us with open source images. Custom stuff is really hard because you've never seen it before. So what we're going to do is make sure to stay on top of um, any new version that comes out of you know, Ingress Nginx, for example. Run it longer than two minutes in a real environment, publish it, and then we can, you know, everyone can check it like you know, a day later after it's released. Um, we have experimented also with running eBPF in like a GitHub action, and then trying to run the image, run the container. We capture everything that it does in CI. Uh, that's a little more complicated. You can do it, but you're you're time bound. You're not you don't want to run it for 20 minutes. So, uh, but we also have found that the first three to five minutes is typically all we need to actually get the the good behavior. Bad stuff happens later, anyways. So. Um, yeah, I'm open to ideas, but the first pass will be more static instant checks against the register, like our catalog. So, but yeah, I think there's opportunity there. Yeah. Oh, two questions. Look at that. Go ahead. You can go first. At runtime? Yeah. Yeah. That it does, yes. Uh, and, and we, just like MongoDB is a perfect example. You know, like at runtime, it has many configurations. So um, we, we do have automation, and we try to kind of keep the 80-20 rule where we're like, we're going to go towards the configuration that the masses use. And then if you deviate, um, the fingerprints themselves aren't always going to throw a drift uh, sort of, it's not always going to yell at you, but that's something that we're going to need to work with folks on like an ongoing basis, essentially, is like if you have an exotic configuration that spawns an entirely new process tree and like calls these IP addresses that we've never seen, um, we're going to need to work to get that locked into the base fingerprint. So yeah, we like Redis, Redis is, you can configure it in a bunch of ways, and we use Redis as our north star for that because it, it it behaves wildly differently depending on how you configured it. So, yeah, it's just something we have to tackle case by case for now. Um, I do think there are ways to run permutations of configuration at runtime, though, that we've seen that can at least get us closer, yeah, without having to manually do it. But you think about like Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes, if you're running EKS, you're pulling in like maybe Cert Manager, some of the native Kubernetes containers. Like those are going to behave the same every time you spin up a new EKS cluster. Um, so that's a good start to like protect Kubernetes first, potentially things like that. Go ahead. Actually going to ask the same yep. Yeah, like things things behave. Differently, yeah, depending on how you configure them. Yeah, we, yeah, we're um, same answer. So, we're we have we have plans, um, and we've you know even Mongo we have pretty solved uh, for, on that front. But it's just going to depend case but by case. A little bit. 
Yeah, so we, we actually use like this, uh, essentially like a glob matching pattern in the, in the fingerprint. So it's not as prescriptive as it looks at visually, where um, a, a process or, or like especially files, right? There's all these like ephemeral files that get created and they go away. We don't treat those as drift ever. Um, we have matching patterns in the tree that kind of just leave it be, right? So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting closer there. And even in our UI, you can just now right click and say add to baseline and it bumps the version. <laughs> um, it's like pretty easy. So, and we'll keep doing that in open source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that like the requirement? Oh, not Tetragon, yeah. No. Um, well, if you want to do, if you want to fingerprint your applications, like your custom right. stuff. Yep. Not, not even talking about custom. Yep. About oh, uh, you will not need to. So phase one is um, you will rely on the RAD, ca our catalog, uh, essentially this like mega project, and, and you will be able to, verify in number one in like CI, just like what an image is doing. You will, we aren't shipping our eBPF agent yet in open source. So um, if there were, if like you pulled Ingress Nginx today and it drifted, like something happened, uh, we wouldn't be able to detect that until we ship that agent to you in open source. Now our commercial customers, that's a different story. They have a we have an eBPF agent for them, but it's just not open source yet. So the CI job will be the first check. So um, I don't know if you've used like, uh, if you've heard of tools like Socket or you know any of these kind of package level CI checks, um, we'll be able to offer Number one, a diff analysis of the behaviors in CI. So if you pull a new version of Nginx, it's gonna say a rundown of what it does at runtime that we've already established. Um, and that'll be phase one. And then phase two will be the eBPF agent that you can do, use to detect drift. And we're working on that now, so yeah. All right, well thank you all, good questions. Appreciate you coming. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Have a good lunch. <laughs>